Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, mona muliwanji, namaste, jumbo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville, in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about this show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app. On Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest today is PJ Hoover. She is here to celebrate Problem Solvers, 15 innovative women engineers and coders. Before we invite PJ into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by our friends at Kinderwood Press. They are the publishers of Namaste is a Greeting, a beautiful picture book. It's written by Suma Subramanian and illustrated by the award-winning artist Sandhya Prabhat. While literally meaning, I bow to you, the word namaste has many different meanings. Not only is it a greeting or something you might say during yoga class, but it is a word to express the deepest of emotions. Namaste calms your heart when things aren't going right. Namaste is saying, you matter. Discover many of its meanings with a young girl as she navigates a bustling market with her mother in this sweet and delightfully illustrated picture book. We really love this book and, and what a great message to teach our kids and remind them every day that they matter. Get your copy today. Namaste is a greeting brought to you by our friends at Candlewood Press. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Skipper Friend or Foe. Abstracting Mystery Within Life's Traumatic Events, written by Kelly Sanchez. Michael is leading what seems to be a pretty normal life for a happy 12-year-old boy. And then the unthinkable happens. His, his mom is diagnosed with cancer. Michael's dad has to take a job out of town because it's the only way they can afford to pay for the treatments. They're so very, very costly. Suddenly, Michael is no longer a carefree kid. He's now his mom's caretaker. When a new friend convinces Michael to follow a mysterious adventure, Michael learns that it's not all up to him to take care of his mom and that it's okay to have fun even through some of life's toughest issues. Skipper, Friend of Foe by Kelly Sanchez. It's a Reading With Your Kids certified great read and will be a great addition to your family library. Coming to us from the beautiful city of Austin in the state of Texas, our guest today is here to celebrate Problem Solvers. It's part of the Women of Power series. Please welcome to the show, PJ Hoover. Hey, PJ, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm wonderful. I'm really excited. I think um, we've had all of the authors of the different Women of Power series books on and it, it just seems like a, a, a fabulous series. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, I'm thrilled. First of all, thank you for having me here on the podcast. But I'm thrilled to be a, a part of the series. Like, honestly, when I got the opportunity to do it, it, I was over the moon pleased. Yeah. So who are the problem solvers we're going to meet in your book? Well, um, so there are 15, and uh, I'll add a 16th in there because there's an introduction by me. I used to be an engineer before I became a full-time writer, so I, I, I can be like the 16th um, problem solver in the book. But it's honestly a, a range of amazing women who are not only doing fantastic work in the fields of engineering and coding, but they also have overcome some amazing obstacles to get to the places where they are um, in their backgrounds and the obstacles that they face currently in the market in engineering and computer science, which both are technically thought of as male-dominated fields. Let's talk about that. And the re and I, I want to talk about that for a very selfish reason. Somebody very, very dear to my heart, my niece, uh, just entered a... Um, into college, and she is studying biomedical engineering. And in five years, she hopes to graduate with a master's and get into the field. And she's at a wonderful um, technical college, and she is only one of a handful of women at the college. And already, it's 
you see, started in September, it's the end of October, and already it's like, I, I want to be around more women. What's going on with this field? Why is it? And I've heard different different thoughts about this, that women are being excluded and uh, other people saying, well, yeah, women just aren't in, they like relationships and guys like things and that's why guys are in engineering and women go into nursing because they like people and you you've been in there, you've lived it and then you've studied it by, by writing about these women. What's your thoughts? Okay, so yeah, it's really interesting because I, let's say I started college in 1987, so that's over 30 years ago, and I was one of four women engineers in the computer engineering program, and so you're talking about now, 30-some years later, and not much has changed with those numbers. Our statistics have not changed in the way that they should, and there are some really good reasons why this is the case. First off, um, one of those reasons is right now, let's say, young girl, let's say there's a young girl in elementary school who's good at math and science. She's the girl that's going to get tapped on the shoulder and told, hey, you could be an engineer, whereas, you know, any guy thinks he could be an engineer. He doesn't have to get tapped on the shoulder. He doesn't have to be the kid who's good at math and science. And so I think we need to change from the very early days. We shouldn't just single out the girls who we think are good at math and science. We should let every girl out there know from a very, very early age that she can be an engineer or a computer scientist. She doesn't have to be good at math and science, whatever that means. You know, those are learned skills. And so that's one of the big things. I think one of the other things is uh, there's a stigma. It's a really interesting stigma around engineering. And so I don't know how old you are, but I was around in the very early 80s when, you know, home computers were a brand new thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember we got our Commodore 64 along with, thousands of other people around the country, and where did those computers go? Well, most of the time they went in the basement of homes, right? And so all of a sudden you have this basement, you know, geeky coder image in people's minds of them sitting, living in their mother's basements, coding on computers all, all day. And I think that image has been has stuck around since the dawn of the home computer age. And so that's one of the images that we need to fight also because it's not like this cool image. And so girls see that and they're like, oh, I don't want to be some person stuck in my basement coding all day long. And so we're trying to break that stigma also. And and so, so those are just a couple of the many, many reasons why we still haven't seen the increase in numbers like we really should have by now. That's really interesting. Um, first off, I mean, a, a, a boy or a girl being good at math in first or second grade, uh, yeah, it might be an indication that they're going to continue to be good at math throughout high school, but it's not a guarantee. And and the, the opposite is true. Just because a kid might be struggling in first grade doesn't mean that they're not going to get it and fall in love with math at, at, at some point. So I absolutely agree with you. We should be encouraging all kids to explore all the opportunities that we have out there and, you know, and – you know, get rid of the stigma that a lot of guys might, might may prevent guys from going into nursing, for example. Um, you know, the image of the nerdy guy in the basement, this is the first for me. This, you're the first person who's brought up that, hey, girls don't want to be thought of as a nerdy guy in the basement. I don't blame them. <laughs> But that's where our home computers went. I mean, it, literally, that's where they went. Yeah, because people didn't want them out in their living spaces, you know. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well, when when you got your first computer, I had my first apartment, and it was upstairs. I didn't have a basement. My parents had thrown me out. <laughs> but I was one of those people who, like, it was like computers. I, I can't. That's not. I can't do that. And um, and I re- I learned how to do do computers on one of the first Macintoshes that I, and boy, once I said, I can do this, it was like, never learn how to code, but I'm like, this machine can help me do so many amazing things. Yes, That's- yes. Yeah, once you actually learn the power of the computer, and I had a Macintosh, a Mac Plus in college, and I could churn out reports that looked better than anybody's out there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, of the 15 women that you profile in this book, who is who who is the woman that surprised you the most? So I would say the one that surprised me the most, um, I'm gonna so it's got it's actually the very first chapter in the book. Gabriella Gonzalez is the one that um, surprised me the most. And this woman, 
you know, we, I, we set up our Zoom call. All the interviews were done by Zoom, and we set up the call. I thought, okay, I had my list of questions of what I was going to ask, and I just thought, oh, she'll tell me about her job and what she does day to day. And, you, you know, I said, well, how did you get started? What obstacles did you overcome? And she started telling me a story about, you know, she grew up when she was young. She, she grew up in Mexico, and they were a middle-class family, her and her sister and her mom and her dad. And, you know, then her uh, father was abusive, and the parents got divorced, and the mom moved to the Rio Grande Valley here in Texas, so across the border from Mexico. And they, you know, back when they had been in Mexico, being that they were middle class, college had always been an option, a possibility. And then when they moved to the Rio Grande Valley, they discovered, like, they had no money. They were basically the poor of the poor there. And so college just went out the door. There was just basically no hope for college at that point, as far as she, you know, believed at the time. And then, you know, they had to move from Texas all the way up to Washington State because the ex-husband was was threatening them. And so they move all the way, you know, up across the country to where they have like maybe one relative and they become migrant workers and so basically she's doing this migrant working job she's trying to go to school she's trying to take care of her sister she's nannying trying to make money trying to make any kind of ends meet and just when you know things couldn't get any worse the mom has a horrible car accident you know and and it was just like so many things were stacked against this poor woman right and she wanted to go to college she she had always had these dreams but she's like i just don't know how i can do that and she was part of a youth um, youth group at a church on a reser- nearby reservation, and one of the youth, uh, you know, mentors there basically said, hey, have you ever thought about applying for this degree? And she's like, how could I apply for a degree? And, and he's like, just do it. Let's figure it out. You know, they, they have scholarships for this kind of thing. And she did that, and she was able to go to college and get her degree, and now she is an engineer. And But it was like if she hadn't had that right mentoring, right role modeling, and, and actually taken and acted upon it, I mean, her life could be completely different. And so I just love that, you know, no matter – there's a million excuses for why somebody can't go to college, why somebody can't be an engineer, whatever it is. Um, but there's also ways that we can get through almost any – difficulty that is thrown our way. And I think that's what, not just her story, but so many of these women's stories really show us in this book is, you know, find a way to get through the difficulties that life throws you Mm -hmm. and and make it happen. Believe in your future and make it happen. I, I love that because we are all going to face obstacles in our lives. Uh, Despite the fact that there are so many parents these days who want to bubble wrap their kids and keep them from be feeling any disappointment or getting any scraped knees or, or whatever, uh, the reality is we're going to fall down, we're going to have adversity, and um, if we can teach our kids at an early age to have resilience and to bounce back up and to keep going for those dreams, um, they're going to be in a much better place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, another another of the women, um, Sue Black, she was uh, she was one of my favorites that I interviewed. Actually, they're all my favorites, so I'm not going to say that. But she is a professor over in the UK. And, you know, when she was a very early teenager, her mother died and her father quickly remarried. And she said it was like one of these like wicked stepmother kind of things. And basically, she moved out at a very young age because she had this, you know, abusive house she was living in and she got married. And so by the age of 20, she had three children and, you know, her husband was abusive. And so she didn't know what she was going to do. She basically worked in a record store. That That's, how you know, what her job was. She's 20 years old. She's in an abusive marriage and has three children. And finally, you know, the one evening he threatens to kill them all. And she's like, I have to get out of here. And she goes to a friend's house. He threatens to kill them there. And then she goes to a women's shelter. And basically she lives in this women's shelter and she's safe. You know, at least she's in a safe place. She, she And she's gotten out, herself out of this dangerous situation. And then as her kids, you know, are going to school and stuff, she's like, well, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Here she's like 22 years old. She's like, well, maybe I'll take an evening class in computer science. And now she has a Ph.D. She's a professor. She's a world-renowned speaker talking about the hardships that she's overcome, about the work that she does and everything. And I just love hearing her story. I mean, she, you know, she said, like, the first day she walked into her computer science class with her spiky pink hair and her Doc Martin, she <laughs> didn't fit in even back then. But, you know, she had to find a way to fit in. And a lot of that, what she found 
once she was in the field and going to conferences, is like forming groups to help women find each other because she would go to these conferences and it would be like all men sitting around talking to each other, kind of turning the cold shoulder to her and stuff like that. And so she had to find a way to bring together groups also to help not just herself feel involved but help other women too. And so that's one of the big things that she tries to do. Now, I don't want somebody out there listening uh, to think that the only way to become a successful engineer if you're a woman is to grow up in an abusive family. <laughs> That's definitely not the case at all, yes. Okay. <laughs> do, we, do we have a happier story amongst the 15 that you met? Oh, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of happy stories. Okay, so here's one that has a challenge, but it's not an abusive relationship, if you will, because I like to think that each woman brings something different to the mm-hmm. table. And so Meredith um, Westifer, she is a vice president at Tesla. And, you know, so that's a great company. She basically had moved to North Carolina with her husband. Um, she's an industrial engineer. And, you know, they were working there. He had the job. And then she got this amazing job opportunity you know, out far west to go work in it, for Tesla, you know, and it, she was like, they talked about it, and she's like, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could, and, and they talked it through, and he's like, they decided that she needed to do this, and so for two years, you know, they worked through a long-distance relationship, and, and I think that's also another important thing, um, why a lot of women are afraid to do a career like engineering, is they're afraid of, like, the family implications, or they aren't going to be there to do the laundry or the cooking or whatever it is, and I think, you know, so so they will work through this long-distance relationship for two years, and I think that's something that women need to accept also, is, like, it, it doesn't just come down to women to do all the responsibilities responsibilities around the house and that's something that I think women bring that on themselves a lot too that we need to learn to release and learn to speak up more for ourselves and say where we need help and what help we need so yeah the, there's many happy stories um I like Sophia of Vel- uh, um she it, when she she grew up in um this uh family her family always wanted her to be a doctor and finally the one time they're like okay we accept that she's not going to be a doctor you know she's they thought, they, but they still didn't quite know what she did, right? So mm-hmm. she sent a picture of herself in a clean room suit. I'm not sure if you know what a clean oh, room suit oh, is. Yeah, uh, yeah. And With so, so basically, she sends everything. Yeah, so she sends her parents a picture of herself in this clean room suit, and her parents tell all their friends about their daughter, the astronaut. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but you know, she uh, she had one of my favorite um, analogies and, and that in the whole book, and because at the end of each chapter, there's something that I, I try to end at the end of each chapter with some kind of highlight or some kind of takeaway. And I loved the one that she gave, which was, you know, she's a very short woman. She's maybe five two, and she's married to somebody who's about. 6263. Six, so he's a foot taller than her, let's just say. And one of the things they love doing as a family is rock climbing. And, you know, when they go out to the rock climbing wall, you know, he has these giant long arms that can reach way high and everything like that, you know. And she, she can't take this, she can't reach the same rocks that he can. And her whole point was, you know, like, we're all going for the same goal. We're all trying to get to the top, but everybody's path that gets taken, everybody's path is going to be different. And that's an important thing to keep in mind is like we have 15 amazing stories in this book, but anybody who picks this up, book up and reads it and wants to be an engineer or a coder is going to take a different path than anybody else in here. And and, and so I think I loved her, her analogy of saying that, um, that, that as long as you're moving up and moving forward, you're going to reach the goal if yeah. you keep at it. That really is a great analogy because it it is true. We we all have different abilities. We're challenged by different things. Uh, We have different experiences. We look at the world in a different way. Um, And and we do have to take different paths to to find our happiness. I think that's a great lesson for kids, again, for kids to learn at an early age. And um, if it's something I think that we as parents share with our kids, as they're growing up and, and helping them understand that it's it's okay if you have to take a different path. You know, you don't, you know, just because you don't enter college and know exactly what you want to do at 18 years old and get the four-year degree and jump into that job, if it takes you a few more years to figure it out, maybe, you know, a community college here and then a college there, that's okay as long as you keep moving forward. 
Exactly, exactly. Find a way to do it, you know, whatever it is. And, like, you know, in the book, you know, each chapter is set up where there's basically a chapter about the woman, and then there's three breakout kind of sidebars that talk about different useful information or different tidbits, whatever it might be. And some of the sidebars that that readers will find in the book are things like um, how to afford college, you know, because I think that's a big concern, for example, like, how I how am I going to afford to go to college? You know, but there there are ways. You know, um, what is a master's degree? You know, a lot of people are like, I don't even know what a master's degree is or an advanced degree or anything like that. And so, kind of demystifying a lot of those aspects in there. Um, yeah, and so so so. Like, looking through the book, there are lots of cool ones. What's the importance of business cards and, like, business card etiquette in different cultures? Because if you are in a professional field, you might go to Japan, and you better know what to do with a business card when you're given one, you know, unless you want to offend somebody. So, um, yeah, so so I hope readers will enjoy those different sidebars. Okay, I'm intrigued. What do you do with the business card in Japan? So, so from what I've heard, uh, basically, like, a business card is a very, very important so, token. Mm-hmm. I basically, it, it's like being given a gift. And I, I believe, and I could get this completely wrong, or but I believe they present it with two hands, and you're supposed to receive it with two hands, and make sure you look at it, and don't like turn it over and start scribbling something on the back or anything like that. Think of it as like this is a gift that's been given to you. It, it's it's a very important thing. And so, um, I remember hearing one story about somebody who didn't know this, and they went to Japan, and they got this business card, and then the person was like, oh, and I can give you my phone number. They immediately turned the card over and start scribbling the phone number on the back and the person is just appalled, you know. And so, because that's the kind of thing, like, it, you know, it, it could cost you a business deal in the future if you, if you, so wherever you're traveling, I think that, you know, it's good to know the customs yeah, going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There should be roadmaps for cultures. Yeah. You know, we all sit down, we get the map for the subway of the city that we're visiting or, or the bus routes, um, but we never... Sometimes we forget to sit down and go. Okay, so how do I greet somebody? How do I how do I act if I go to this place? What's what's the protocol for this place? What's the protocol for that place? Really, and uh, I, you know, uh, w- when I travel to Latin American countries, it's long pants. It can be 130 degrees outside, but I got my long pants on because <laughs> I learned from not doing that that it's uh, a big faux pas for a guy. To, to walk around in short pants. It's like... Oh, see, I wouldn't have known that. Yeah, yeah. Hello, I'm an American, and don't take me seriously. <laughs> hey, how did you... You know, I'm looking at your website. You, you, you've you written dozens and... Uh, uh, two dozen books? Probably uh, over 30. Probably okay. about 35, 36 books, yeah. And a wide variety. Chapter books and YA books and middle grade novels. Is this your first nonfiction title? So, so it's my... Um, I actually snuck out a nonfiction title before this one, so it's my second technically. So I do a combination of traditional publishing and self-publishing. And so, for example, um, Problem Solvers is a traditionally published book through Chicago Review Press, but I also self-published some books, and I self-published a writing guide um, a few months before this book. And one of the things I love writing are interactive adventures. I don't know if you remember Choose Your Own Adventure Stories. Uh, we've had <laughs> we've had authors on about those. Um, so many times. I love writing those books. I have a whole series under a pseudonym, um, my pseudonym of Connor Hoover, and the series is called Pick Your Own Quest. And, and there's like three Minecraft titles. There's Alice in Wonderland. There's Fairy Tales. So they're so much fun to write. They're just a blast. I'm actually working on a horror one right now. But I wrote a writing guide for kids on how to write your own interactive adventure because, you know, It's a really fun way to make writing not intimidating. I think a lot of kids don't like writing because they're scared to write it. And, you know, when you're writing interactive adventures, it's just a blast. And so so I did write a writing guide on that. But then Problem Solvers is my first novel-length nonfiction book. Well, you know, I I present magic shows at schools around the country, and they're always interactive. They're they're always different and, and in fact we had some, uh, an international student with us uh, for a tour she was toured with me for three weeks and at the end of the three weeks she just turned to me she goes you never did the same show twice how, how, how do you how do you do that and I'm like this keeps me sane. Yes. <laughs> Actually, that's probably better because sometimes I do author presentations and I do the same presentation over and over. And I'm like, oh, I can't even stand to hear myself talk anymore sometimes by the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. When you do something 300 times a year, you, you <laughs> want to change it up a yes. little bit. Well, this has been a lot of fun. And um, I'm, I'm really excited. Now that you've, you've 
had this experience of, of finding these these women engineers and, and sharing their stories. I, I know you love writing fiction and, and that, that interactive fiction. Are you planning on writing some more nonfiction titles? So I would certainly love to. I honestly found it was such a different, unique experience. And, and the fact that, I mean, everything about it was different because it was so much more than just the writing. You know, it was for, down to the coordination of emailing the women and setting up the interviews and finding the, the nuggets within their stories, you know. And so, you know, it's something I would definitely have a conversation with my agent about and see if there is an opportunity out there for me to write a nonfiction. Yeah, so I would love to do that, especially if it could be something with engineering because, you know, I was an engineer for 15 years. And so this was like, this book was like a perfect way for me to bring together my world of engineering, which I was passionate about, and writing, which is now my career, and which I love. And so, so it was such a great opportunity for me. And so if there was another opportunity within some type of engineering tie-in, I would love it. Okay. One last question again. It's uh, selfish because because uh, this is my podcast. I can do it. Um, advice for my niece. So your niece, you said, just went to college, right? She yeah. just entered. She's in a biomedical engineering program. Um, you know, I, th- I think first off, recognizing that there are going to be challenges. You know, even, even, I, as women, we there, there's so much that we have to fight against. You know, and you just have to recognize that that's the case. And I mean, like, you know, for example, one of these women um, said, you know, one of the biggest problems with, or not not the biggest problems, but one of the biggest obstacles you face as a female engineer is if you walk into a room full of people, right? A meeting. Let's say you walk into a meeting. You constantly have to show your credentials almost ahead of time so people take you seriously, whereas a male doesn't have to do that. People automatically think the male is has his credentials or whatever. And so I think recognizing and accepting that while also trying to be the best that you can be, you know, and that doesn't mean you have to be absolutely perfect in whatever it is. But, I mean, be the best that you can be. Be professional and 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 check your work. Be smart. And then people will learn to respect you until you get to the point where you don't have to be the person who automatically has to show their credentials walking in the door. And I think that's one of the women, Kara Sprague, had said that. She's like, you know, now when I walk into a room or when I make a phone call or get on a conference call, people know me, they respect me, and nobody's questioning my abilities or my authority anymore more you know and yeah and I, I love engineering so if you're if your niece is passionate about engineering I really hope she sticks with it and don't don't let her you know think that it, you know it's too male dominated mm-hmm. because you know what it's a it's a great field that's awesome we've had oh we need to know where to find you online oh yeah so my website is uh, pjhoover.com and so basically you can go to that website and then like even the pseudonym that I mentioned, the Connor Hoover, like the pick your own quest books, there's links to all those through that website and everything like that. But yeah, so on my books page, you can see all my books um, that I've written, different, tons of different genres. You can see any speaking engagements. I mean, if you're interested in a speaking engagement or school visits or anything like that, all my information is on there. I've had a great time speaking about problem solvers, 15 amazing women engineers And our guest has been the author, P.J. Hoover. P.J., thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. This is such a treat. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Dora Andre. She'll be here to celebrate Magical Meadow. You don't want to miss it. It's a lot of fun. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, you don't want to miss an opportunity to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Be sure to check, click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page to find out how we can help you celebrate your book to the world. You can be a guest here on the podcast. You can submit your book to our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read panel. You can also take part in our monthly promotion program. You can learn all about that and more by going to readingwithyourkids.com and clicking on that Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. Right now, I'd like to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, P.J. Hoover. Please be sure to check out Problem Solvers. Also want to thank our sponsors, Kelly Sanchez. Be sure to check out her Reading With Your Kids certified great read middle grade novel, Skipper, Friend or Foe, Distracting Mystery Within Life's Traumatic Events. Also want to thank our friends at Kendall Press. Be sure to check out their... Their new picture book, Namaste is a Greeting. Beautiful book, beautiful message. Also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. 